Hey y'all, it's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans, and we're gonna be walking down Bourbon Street this morning. Some people love it, some people hate it, but everybody's heard of it. And it is part of the historic French Quarter neighborhood, which we are right on the edge of now. This Canal Street is the border of the neighborhood. Everything gets started right here. And if you wanna to get to know more about the whole place, we've got a whole separate video for that. But we're gonna take you down the most famous street in the whole thing, our bar strip. And we're gonna be seeing it at the beginning of its day without its face on. It's 9.30 in the morning. There's gonna be a few people there, but it's in a quiet time, both for the time of the day and just the time of its life. COVID has things pretty quiet here right now. We'll get you a sense of what it's all about, some of the history that's easier to miss when things are at their full force. Come check it out. So y'all, Bourbon Street, the first block, you wouldn't know where you were during the daytime. And normally if you were here at night, first thing you'd see as you got onto this side of the street is a brass band. You have a big classic New Orleans style brass band, usually the TBC brass band playing right here, giving you a very distinctively local welcome onto the street. Lots of the hotels are right around here. Most of the streetcar lines meet right around here. So it's a really easy spot to get to. This first block, a lot of stores and restaurants. One of them right at the end of the block up here is Bourbon House. And Bourbon House is one of the very few places on the street where you're likely to actually drink bourbon. So Bourbon Street is not named after the beverage. It is coincidentally connected with the beverage, but Bourbon the Drink is named after Bourbon County, Kentucky, where the thing was invented. And that and Bourbon Street here are both named after the same thing, the Bourbon monarchy, the French kings. So back when France originally colonized Louisiana, Louisiana was a lot bigger and it included Kentucky. So multiple things here were named after those people. And it just so happened by complete coincidence that Bourbon Street and Bourbon County, Kentucky both became famous for alcohol in different ways. So it hasn't always been the reputation here. This used to be a quiet residential middle-class corridor. If we had renamed it for being a bar strip, we'd probably rename it like Beer Street or Daiquiri Street or Mysterious Puddle Street. So not quite in line with the kind of things you tend to drink here. Bourbon gets thought of as a classy drink. Bourbon is not such a classy street most of the time. What we have always had in New Orleans though is a red light district kind of thing somewhere, a vice district. And it hasn't always been here, but it has always existed. And actually for a while, it was right here on the cross street. Iberville Street is one of the few streets in the quarter that has been renamed. It used to be called Custom House Street. And there was a time in the 19th century when that word Custom House would have sent a shiver up the spine of any respectable person in New Orleans. Nowadays, it's one of the easiest streets just to miss. You just tend to cross it. but it used to be the place where all the people passing through town would have gravitated towards. It's the thing about port towns, just like tourists, sailors have this kind of what happens here stays here attitude. And so there's always been a part of the city that was dedicated to doing whatever you feel like for the night. So. Nowadays along here, used to be right back there. We also used to have a neighborhood called Storyville, which was a semi-legal red light district for a while. This was actually pretty classy back in that time. Galatois right here, famous French Quarter Creole restaurant. Creole restaurant having this kind of connotation of upscale French food suited to Louisiana. Galatois has been here since 1909, before most of the bars on the street. Their bar is named Galatois 33. That's honoring a different year the year that prohibition ended, the 14 years when we banned alcohol in the United States, which you can imagine definitely overlaps a lot with Louisiana's, especially New Orleans' history. Now Galatoise is a place where you'd probably go for turtle soup, for example, classic mix of upscale French and uh, what's available in the swamp. And if you were to come to town on a Friday afternoon, you'd see a crazy line out that building. Friday lunch there is an institution, think like law firm types from New Orleans tend to go to that restaurant on Fridays. 
the line is so daunting that they will hire people to wait in line for them. And once you're inside, it's assumed that there's going to be a round of Sazerac cocktails for everybody, a very strong whiskey drink that's the official cocktail of the city. And so you can imagine that also leads to a tradition of long weekends in New Orleans. Coming up on another institution, too. Right across the way is the Old Absinthe House, currently called Jean Lafitte's Old Absinthe House. But the name is something that's changed with time. The history of this place is a little bit ambiguous. So there's been a building here since around 1800, a bar here since around 1840. And the name Jean Lafitte belongs to a famous pirate here. Jean Lafitte and Andrew Jackson, who was going to be the president of the United States, met somewhere in New Orleans to figure out strategy for a battle, the Battle of New Orleans, that they were going to lead together. And this is one of the places that claims that legend. Not the only one, but in a place with so much ambiguity. It's one thing that can't be too hard disputed. But we'll see other spots that have to do with these folks as we go further along. Also, just like it's closed now, this place got shut down for a little bit during Prohibition. So this is actually the oldest bar on Bourbon Street, if you don't count that closure. It hasn't operated continuously the entire time. But if you ever get the chance to go inside, it's famous for having business cards plastered all over the walls. Visitors for many, many years have been leaving their little mark behind. And they do still serve absinthe, which was a hard thing to find here for a long time because of the law and is now a hard thing to find because it's just not super conventional American tastes. But you can get it and absinthe cocktails made here and a few other spots in the neighborhood too. Got another classic Creole restaurant here, y'all, Arno's. This is a little bit younger, but it's another one of these fancy dress places, famous for a jazz brunch. Jazz also, bit of a presence here on the street. Further down, we're gonna pass by the Royal Senesta Hotel right over here. And they're actually the home to the Jazz Playhouse, which is one of the most local sounding venues for music on Bourbon Street, especially, and really in the French Quarter. Not always a jazz venue necessarily, but it's really young. Uh, that's so one of the best jazz places on Bourbon Street is something that's come around in just the last few years. You actually don't hear as much jazz as you might expect on Bourbon Street. We do have this little spot called Musical Legends Park. So this is a public park with monuments to folks like Fats Domino, Pete Fountain. This is the guys on the left and right here who famously worked on or around Bourbon Street and played jazz and styles derived from jazz. You've also got over here on the right, a monument to Chris Owens. And we will see the venue that she is famous for a little bit further along. This spot could be useful to y'all if you end up coming in. The business in the back is a Cafe Beignet, which is a little bit like a Cafe Du Monde. Uh, if you get people into conversations about the best place to get beignets in New Orleans, there are some pretty strong partisans on either side of that line. But uh, it is a public park. You can sit down freely in the space that they offer here and their restroom is public too, which can be very, very useful on Bourbon Street. But a little further down, we'll pass by the Jazz Playhouse. Also passing by one of the first of our daiquiri joints, y'all. So all up and down the street, I mentioned daiquiris as one of the drinks that we're known for. You'll see these places that either just say daiquiris or say frozen cocktails, stuff like that. So one of the things that makes us super famous is that you can drink outside here, and what you tend to drink outside is these massive blends of shaved ice, five kinds of liquor, and a lot of sugar. So not exactly the Cuban daiquiri that they're named after, but these are drinks which not only is it legal to drink outside pretty much everywhere in New Orleans, but with these drinks, these big frozen daiquiris, it is legal everywhere in Louisiana to buy one of these drinks at a drive through from inside your car. As long as the drink is frozen, there's a lid on it, and there's not a straw that protrudes therefrom. So, some strange laws in Louisiana. You also could drink as a passenger in a vehicle, any vehicle, until 2004. You can still drink as a passenger in a for hire vehicle in New Orleans today. So, freedoms you could indulge in while you're here. All the work of a particular person I'll tell you more about later. Looking off of Bourbon Street a bit, y'all, we have here Aaron Rose right next to a daiquiri shop. This is more the Bourbon Street atmosphere. That's more the French Quarter atmosphere as a whole. Aaron Rose is an Irish-style bar famous for selling uh, spiked iced coffees. 
and also great Bloody Marys. Got a po' boy shop in the back of that. There's a lot of cool stuff to be found just off of Bourbon Street. So as you're walking, even though all the noise is along the street here, it's good to keep looking in either direction. You'll spot some great stuff. Bars like the 21st Amendment, which is a great little music club. Spots like the Starlight Lounge, also just off the street. A lot of the best music in the neighborhood is there. So I said you don't get a whole lot of jazz. Actually, most of the music here is gonna tend to be classic rock cover bands. And this street actually had a lot to do with how jazz came to be, or really came to be a mainstream American genre. So you go back to the origins of jazz, beginning of the 20th century thereabouts, it really wasn't here very much. It was over in other neighborhoods, a little further in this direction, not nearly as well preserved as this area is. And then the big moment for this was World War II. Before World War II, mostly what you would see along Bourbon was houses and shops. And for the first couple blocks, there would have been a few bars, places where you might hear a solo piano player and see a can-can dancer. A little bit of jazz by the time you get to the 40s, and that's a key moment because World War II brings a huge number of Americans to New Orleans for the first time. Prior to that, mostly the spread of jazz around the country had happened by way of the Great Migration. So black Southerners, leaving southern cities, going elsewhere, looking for safety and opportunity. And they bring their music with them. And in each city it goes to, it evolves into something new. So it gets popular in major cities, among certain crowds anyway. But for the general population, and especially for white Americans, jazz doesn't really catch on until World War II, when about a third of the US military passes through New Orleans, either on leave or shipping out, since we're one of the five points of embarkation. So it's their last impression of safety and hospitality. They're hanging out in these bars on Bourbon Street, the few that there were, and it creates this memory. It creates a soundtrack, it creates escape that they wanna come back to, and vacations for those folks for the next couple decades to come are all about coming to Bourbon Street. So that's really where the legend comes in and where the bars proliferate to the number that they are now. This, y'all, is the Chris Owens Club. So you saw the statue of her back there. She comes from that chapter after World War II when a lot of people started coming here for vacations. And what you get exploding onto this scene then in the 50s especially is burlesque and various other kinds of dance as the main form of entertainment. Chris Owens, this venue and her name actually has been here since the late 50s. And the most remarkable thing about her is she is still there. This is a woman in her 80s still performing, albeit not during the quarantine, twice a week. And I had a great birthday here. It's hard to imagine her show, but based on experience, I can say, like, imagine Dolly Parton at like 87 with black hair doing kind of a low budget community theater, understaffed, whimsical, affectionate homage to 1950s burlesque with a Latin twist. That's her show and very much depends on audience involvement to work. I think I went uh, very early in the show, usually it gets going about nine o'clock, and sat down at a table very close to the stage. They're all close to the stage. The doorman, as you come in, turns out to also be the bartender and the sound tech and the backup singer. And that foreshadows the audience has a lot to do. So sat down, Chris came over and extended her hand down and I thought we were shaking hands. And so I grabbed her hand and she is very strong. She pulled me up on the stage and somehow got me into a giant foam cowboy hat and onto a toy horse in seconds. And I got the message and I made a fool of myself for a few minutes to entertain the crowd while she caught her breath and drank some water. So definitely come ready, pregame a little bit perhaps, but it is one of the most uh, historic in a way, places on Bourbon Street and definitely one to have a one of a kind good time. So as you come back, hopefully soon, because Chris is probably close to retirement this is one of the places not to miss, at least to pass by and see the photos. There's the lady herself. She also does an Easter parade every year, and that is something to see. The lighting in here is a bit more delicate than the sunlight during the Easter parade. So if you get the chance in the month of April, come and see her out of doors. That whole burlesque era, y'all, gives this street so much color. So you'll find a few burlesque shows still in New Orleans today. But back in the 50s into the early 60s, 
it was the main thing. And because there was so much, every place had to kind of stand out whatever way it could. So you got dancers who had this like special thing that only they could do. So you'd get a, uh, a performer like Rita Alexander, the champagne girl. And you'd see the sign, you'd know she was gonna do something with champagne, but you didn't know what. And if you went to watch the show, what you learned is she could toast you with glasses of champagne without using her hands. And then there were people like uh, Evangeline, the oyster girl, who would do an act coming out of a big oyster shell with a, a giant pearl, it's based on a Henry Wadsworth Longfellow poem. And she had a famous rivalry with Divina, the sensational Aquates, who did an underwater act. So there's a famous moment when Evangeline, the oyster girl, is losing audience to Divina, the sensational Aquates, and Evangeline goes to Divina's show, watches part of it, sees her doing the act underwater, holding her breath. Whether she's impressed or mad or whatever, she goes up on the stage and attacks the aquarium with an ax and like sends glass and water exploding through the rest of the venue. Memorable night. Wish I could tell you you could see that if you came to Bourbon Street today. It's a little bit more, uh, not so choreographed as it used to be. A lot of spontaneous moments, but more of the uh, sliding down a pole variety. Anyway, across the way, y'all, we got one of our many hotels. This is the former site of an opera house. So when I said earlier, based on the restaurants, that Bourbon used to be a pretty upscale street. You had opera happening on this street up until 1909 when the place burned down during a rehearsal of Carmen. So we lose that then. There are some places that pay tribute to it right in the area. Another little thing that we have a tiny vestige of. So we used to have a small Chinatown in this area, just a couple of blocks. You'll see reference to it if you ever read or watch the movie of Streetcar Named Desire. And the only rec little vestige of it you can see is the Chinese characters and the name added up here, which of course has been vandalized to uh, just represent the Bourbon Street mindset. But little touch of something that used to be around there was another Chinatown on the other side of Canal Street nearby, too. Passing by our second Tropical Isle establishment, y'all. If we talk about giant drinks, you can't miss Tropical Isle. There's one on the right over here. The drink they sell is the hand grenade, which is named after the container it's in, which looks a little bit like a hand grenade. It's massive, super sweet, but they advertise really, really well by getting everybody to carry their containers around. See how many Tropical Isle locations you can spot as we walk. Actually got another one right next to it. This place, the Bayou Club, is your best bet if you want to get a Zydeco soundtrack while you're here. Zydeco is the traditional music of the Cajun part of the state, southwest Louisiana. Real fun, dancey accordion and fiddling. And these place, this place actually is one of the ones that does it almost every single day. So, real reliable spot for a more of a local sound than most of the street is going to have. Passing by a few other pretty famous spots. What's up, y'all? This is a piece of the Court of Two Sisters restaurant that opens up onto the other side of the block. Another famous Creole establishment. And then you've got Pat O's, Pat O'Brien's. It's a Prohibition era spot rather just a little bit after Prohibition. The guy who opens, the main entrance is right around the corner, opens this place up and creates the Hurricane, another famous cocktail, which was basically made to get rid of as much of this sort of excess supply of rum that we had here as possible. So it's a sweet drink, but it's a fruity one that's a little less cloying than some. Depending on where you get it, if you get it here, it's made from a mix nowadays, but there are like upscale bars in the quarter where you can get the original one made with Fruit juice, passion fruit juice, a few different rums, and it's a bit more of a, more of a delicacy when you get it done that way, depending on your taste. That one will get you there fast. The other one is a good sipping drink. Mentioned these frozen daiquiris, y'all. That and all of these other weird laws that we have in Louisiana is mostly the work of this guy named George Brown. He's a beer and liquor lobbyist who started in the industry in 1949. And the last time taxes on beer went up in Louisiana was 1948. So this guy was a solid wall against anything and everything related to uh, regulating the beer and liquor industry. Quick sec, y'all. A couple famous places right by us. Cat's Meow, one of the better known karaoke joints in the neighborhood. They've got like a page worth of songs, but something for everybody. And then just over here, the 
dingy looking building right between Pat O'Brien's and Pizza Dante is gonna be Preservation Hall. It's just far enough off of Bourbon Street that you're not necessarily gonna notice it during a walk, but it is the traditional jazz establishment. Other good ones besides, including one on Bourbon, just a little bit further down, but that place, if we're talking music, absolutely needs a little bit of attention. So this guy, George Brown, y'all, almost nobody in Louisiana has heard of him, but he has very much affected all of our lives. Uh, when he was working as a lobbyist, one of the pieces of legislation he got taken care of involved him conveying a bribe from a beer company to a state legislator. And even when he was caught, he refused to give the legislator's name away, even though it required him to go to prison for six months in order to keep the secret. And after that, he had the absolute trust of all the politicians that he worked with. So he ends up being pretty much untouchable. And it's, he's the reason why there was so little regulation on alcohol here for such a long time. His biggest loss was when we finally ended up bringing the drinking age to 21, which was the result of the federal government tying highway funding to that. We prefer smooth roads at the very least. But back in the 70s, when this drive through daiquiri business first got started, it was still legal to drink when you were 18. And they got started in a college town, so you can imagine just old enough to be interested in liquor, still young enough to be interested in sugar. Get that overlap going, and a frozen daiquiri is basically a, an alcoholic snowball, as we'd call them. You grow up somewhere hot, you're getting used to those things, just spike it, and you have a business model for life. One other oddity that we have here, this is another hotel built into a building that used to be a convent. And this convent was here into the mid-1960s, when Bourbon was going strong. So you can imagine nuns trying to raise orphans right next to Bourbon Street. That is a thing that happened. Got St. Louis Cathedral, the back of it, right over there. And by the time you get to Royal Street, just a block away, things are night and day different. That's the antique shop and art gallery corridor. Very different atmosphere from all of this. Promise you a great jazz joint as well. Right across the way is Fritzl's Jazz Pub. So if you did go inside of there, you'd hear some of the city's best traditional jazz players. They've got a courtyard behind a vampire-themed speakeasy in the upstairs. So a lot of your different New Orleans stereotypes, true and less true, all piled in the same place. Speaking of New Orleans stereotypes, down here at the end of the block, we've got Marie Laveau's House of Voodoo. Marie Laveau's our famous voodoo priestess, the most famous face of this religion that a lot of people understand more as a kind of black magic thing. But her actual home, the spot where she lived, is just around the corner a couple blocks away. This spot is more selling the souvenir version of voodoo. We actually do have a insider-operated, member of the religion-operated voodoo shop on the next block down. Got a lot of enhanced facades right now, y'all. Been seeing different pieces of uh, street art, let's call it, added on to the pieces of plywood out here as the weeks go by. They come and go, they get covered up, something new shows up, but it keeps the place looking a little less stark under the quarantine conditions. Just look back a little bit. So normally, if you were walking out here under more you know, happening conditions, you'd see some rainbow flags flying out here. We're on the section of Bourbon Street that actually transitions from being zoned for entertainment to being zoned for residences. So things get a lot quieter down here. The exception is some bars that are grandfathered into the zoning, like the Bourbon Pub in Oz right here. This is a cluster of mostly early 20th century gay bars, mid 20th century, that are grandfathered into the way things are right now. And uh, it makes for a fun people watching spot. You can hang out by the intersection and watch as the uh, frat boys make their way down the street, spot the rainbow flags, and as they start to think, should we turn back or have a few more drinks and try something new? So definitely gets to be quieter down in this direction, more of a local crowd hanging out here. Especially the next block down, we're going to run into what is possibly the oldest gay bar in the United States. It goes back to about 1933. So you also can see through here that there are residences on Bourbon Street at this point. People live on Bourbon Street, and it's actually possible to get a peaceful night's sleep. The fact that this was a middle-class corridor before it became a bar strip means the houses here aren't massive, but they're big enough to fit businesses and a bit of a crowd of patrons inside of. So it was really well suited, besides the other things that brought the bar corridor to be, to turning from residences to businesses. 
Some of these would have been businesses in the first place. A lot of classic French Quarter buildings are designed in a way you see lots of other places. Business in the downstairs, residence in the upstairs. And you still actually get that in a little bit of the French Quarter now. So this is the same architecture that you see further up amongst the bars. Just without the neon and the signs and everything, it stands out. The history stands out a little bit more. There's two more bars on Bourbon, y'all. Both pretty historical ones. And they're actually pretty related. So right up here, we have Cafe Lafitte in Exile. This is that possibly oldest gay bar in the country. It goes back to 1933 in terms of being an institution. It wasn't at this location at the time. It was a block further down. And some kind of misunderstanding around the ownership of the place led to that bar being exiled, hence it ending up here. Uh, this building doesn't have any connection with the Lafitte brothers, the pirates that we mentioned earlier, but the other one does, possibly. So if you came by here on normal circumstances, you'd find karaoke going on, you'd find possibly tons of napkins littered into the street from a little tradition that they have of hurling cocktail napkins all over the place. Definitely a beloved local spot, even though fewer people live in the quarter than used to, this is where a lot of them are going to hang out. This too is where we got a, one of the locally run voodoo shops moving in pretty soon. Got our pride shop open and operating. And on this side we got classic po' boy joint and the clover grill, which is the ultimate hangover food. They make hamburgers under hubcaps and all kinds of other stuff that will either uh, cure a hangover or prevent it. And by the time you bar hop this far down, definitely you're ready for that kind of thing. So that's a small hours of the morning kind of place. It stays open nice and late. One last thing to see, y'all, is at the end of the block, we've got Lafitte's Blacksmith Shop. And this is a place that's pretty famous for claiming to be the oldest building operating as a bar in the country, saying it's the oldest bar on Bourbon Street. It's all pretty fuzzy. The building is definitely one of the oldest in the city, though we don't know exactly where it comes from, the later part of the 18th century somewhere. And it may or may not have been a blacksmith shop, but definitely you get to get some classic New Orleans historic ambiance, more so on the inside than the outside. It's a little played up on the outside, but you do get a single piano player who knows every song in the world, who's gonna be a classic source of like the kind of entertainment that you would have gotten here before this place was putting on quite as much of a show as it does these days. It can get super crowded, Definitely, you can lose that ambiance sometimes, but be here on a weeknight, and it can definitely give you a sense of like a bourbon street that's bygone. Anyway, this is the, probably the extent of the walk you do. If you kept going down this way, you run into some residential area, and then you'd eventually find the street peters out when you get into the next neighborhood, the Marigny. Most of these French Quarter streets keep going and have a lot more personality further down, but Bourbon Street is pretty much just a French Quarter phenomenon. So you could walk the whole thing in not too much time. If you're bar hopping, Save yourself for just half. So y'all, if you come and visit us in the next little bit, I can promise you this street will be here, I can promise you a lot of these bars will be here, and I can promise you it will look not much like what you saw this time around. Even on a morning in normal times, this is a place that's still pretty hopping. So you'll probably have a lot more company. At the very least, it's a great street for people watching, whether you want to do the full-on bar experience or not. And there's a lot of little hidden treasures along the way, which hopefully I've helped you find. Whether this is going to be the whole of your trip or whether it's going to be a tiny part of your trip, it definitely deserves at least a little bit of attention. So thanks for watching. Be tuned in for the next one. Thank you.